to the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Very touched and very humbled hearing the testimonies. You would think that because these realities uh, you know, every day I receive testimonies from people literally around the world just sharing the marvelous workings of the Spirit through the Word and through this ministry. And you would think that having um, gone through this routine for a very long time, you would think there would be no more excitement. But I tell you sincerely, for every time I hear and get to see the wonder-working power of God through this ministry across the globe. I am humbled afresh. You must maintain that attitude of excitement. You must maintain that attitude that celebrates the slightest manifestation of the hand of God. For as long as no man can do it by his strength, we owe God thanks and forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Please listen to me. I give you a guarantee by the spirit of the living God. If you pay attention to the things that you are learning, week in, week out, if you make up your mind as a determination to submit yourself to these doctrines and this truth, I give you a guarantee based on the integrity of the word of God. You will never live an ordinary life. Believe me. Believe me. The responsibility is on you to be determined. It is not something you don't get determined when you come to church. You make up your mind. God giving you the grace that I will submit to these truths. I'm not going to come and argue. I'm not going to come and try to tamper with these spiritual equations. I am childlike enough to receive with meekness, like the Bible says, the engrafted word. The Bible says that the word of Christ should dwell in you in all wisdom. We're not going to become great just by wishing. We're not going to be able to do so much for the kingdom just by blind desire. It takes more than that. There is a pathway according to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. The Bible says to stand in the way. That ancient path, it says to ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And then it says to walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. So every time I come here for Koinonia, whether it's here in Abuja or any, anywhere at all, I am, I am, I come with a determination and I come with a safe assumption that everyone who would be under the influence of my voice would have made up their minds to receive, not just hear, hearing and receiving are two different things. Make up your mind to not just be a hearer. Oh, I'm writing, I'm writing. Be determined. A student's kind of determination. I am receiving truth that is consistent with scripture, backed up by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. First to help me know the Lord and love him more. Listen carefully. This is the protocol. Number one in order of priority is that my assignment here is to fuel your desire for the things of God. That is my primary assignment in order of priority. That you should never be part of this vision and not love Jesus and not be passionate about the things of God. 
so your heart and your commitment and your fire number one number two that you are able to understand the systemic character of god the structure of the kingdom that nothing just happens and then to submit yourself to the truths that make for transformation transformation metamorphosis you are moving from one state to the other superior versions of yourself so that the version of you that came is not the version that remains you should never be the same person who came to church and then you return back as the same person no no nobody meets with the word of god sincerely and returns back the same no you should return wiser you should return better you should return with a greater sense of illumination john 1 5 and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so i want you to make up your mind if you are yet to do so make up your mind inspired by the spirit and this charge that every time i come for koinonia or every time i invite people to join me that includes those who are following from around the world make up your mind to be a student submit yourself to knowledge submit yourself to doctrine submit yourselves to truth be malleable enough to allow the word of god come not just to inform you not just to be an addition upon the negative templates that may have been in your mind you must submit to the word of god there are things you will hear that are a reminder there are things you will hear that are a new spiritual information there are things you will hear that is a tool for deliverance largely deliverance through transformation now we come from different cultures we come from different um you know we've gone through different experiences and when god brings this convergence listen very carefully you must submit yourself to learn as though you do not know anything this arrival mentality is why many people do not receive from the lord are we together So when you come before the rabbi, the rabbi being the spirit of God, not just the vessel he's using, the spirit of God, you must be intentional. See the value, listen carefully, see the value behind the truths that you learn, that every spiritual truth, every spiritual principle you learn has value to your destiny, all wise, not just material value, that is the least the peace and satisfaction that comes to you knowing that you are walking in dominion ignorance is dangerous it keeps you in fear it keeps you in doubt the bible calls knowledge and wisdom stabilizers it says they shall be the stability of your times hallelujah every time the word of god is about to come beware of the following number one distraction because Satan wants to fight you from receiving the word. You can be in a meeting and not really be there. Distracted by all kinds of things. Whether it's your electronic device or whatever it is. Let your mind, your spirit, your soul, your body be there with a determination to learn. Hallelujah. Yes. Number two, familiarity. You have to be careful. Never get to a point where, oh, you think I know. John chapter 3 verse, then you help the preacher say 16. You will be surprised that it is 16, but you will never learn anything. Hallelujah. Yeah. Approach the word of God with the passion of a child. Jesus was speaking about the kingdom and he said, let the little children come to me. He says, do not forbid them for, for such. That means it will take that, that level, that attitude being childlike to receive the things of the kingdom as for me i remain committed under god to make sure that every opportunity god grants that i do not waste your time shadow boxing it is my commitment under god to ensure that every time we are gathered like this you are exposed to sound doctrine that is consistent with the template given by the apostles consistent with the recommendations of scripture cut across several divides to the end that we be built and established holistically the key word 
holistically lopsided spiritual growth will end us in all kinds of imbalances like we see across the body of christ i will never be the kind of preacher who will come to teach you on spirituality and your passion for god and your love for god and ignore the need for you to rise to a position of kingdom influence where your voice be heard and that you are relevant as far as kingdom come is concerned god according to scripture is mindful of every aspect and every dimension of our lives cutting across mental transformation fire and passion for spiritual things the supernatural finances peace all wise and this we will do as god grants grace my part is to remain committed your part is to remain intentional about reception so whether you are in the main auditorium or any of the overflows outside or following from across you know make up your mind every opportunity you have to listen to the truths that come from this altar be determined to receive them as the words of God to you through a man. Are we in agreement? So one more time, I'd like you to pray tonight and ask the Lord for illumination. The light shineth in darkness. Go ahead and pray. Our destinies are at the mercy of the truths that we know. Is someone praying? Go ahead and pray. You are praying for yourself, but you are also praying for the destinies connected to you. There are destinies depending on your understanding, depending on your level of enlightenment, depending on your level of spiritual illumination. For their sake, pray. Pray for understanding. Pray that the anointing that backs the word of God will fall upon you whilst the word of god is taught every dimension of spiritual truth has an engracing that follows it in jesus name we pray amen many years ago i had a vision you've heard me talk again and again about this vision in this vision i was caught up in the realm of the spirit and i saw this giant door sort of very ancient door looked like this ancient city gates and the holy spirit just zoomed that vision closer to me and i found out that that giant gate or door was made up of smaller doors smaller doors just like if you have an idea of how the post office used to be you know those boxes yes so that was how it was and it was opening and closing opening and closing and every time it opened i saw light coming out of it then it will close then open again and as i came closer i found out that on every one of those smaller doors there was a scripture written that was when the lord taught me that every revelation of truth in scripture has the grace and the anointing that backs it that means if you claim to have caught a dimension of spiritual truth and you do not have the anointing and the engracing to validate it here and now it may not yet be a revelation to you because for every revelation of god's word that you have that becomes spirit and life to you there is an anointing that is back of that revelation that compels you to produce results consistent with the truths you have learned i have taught us here that the assignment of the anointing is to validate the speakings of god if God does not say anything, the anointing has no ministry. Please understand this. The anointing does not work outside of the word. Here is the balance between the age-long error that has existed, especially among Pentecostals and Charismatics. There are a group of people who choose the anointing and ignore the word, and there are a group of people who choose the word and ignore the anointing. Never has there been such a dichotomy according to scripture. They walk hand in hand. The anointing only begins its operation after the word of God has been sent forth. The anointing is the validator of the word. That means if God says be lifted, 
the anointing, the engracing that insists that in spite of all odds you remain lifted comes into motion. The anointing is always there, but it has no assignment for as long as the word of God has not come forth. Are we together now? So in order of priority, the word of God precedes the anointing. The Bible never says in the beginning there was anointing. It never says in the beginning there was power. It says in the beginning was the word. John 1.1 1, 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ called himself the Christ of God. But then his primary name is the word of God. Are we together? Amen. So tonight... I'm here again as a faithful spiritual chef to serve us a menu in the spirit that makes for nourishment, that makes for growth. According to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart, which will feed you. So every man of God, according to scripture, is a spiritual chef and the assignment of this spiritual chef is to make sure you combine the ingredients accordingly. You don't cook in the presence of the people. You prepare the meal. And when they come, you never call the people until the feast is ready, according to scripture. Is that true? And so when all things are ready, then you go to the byways and the highways and you compel the people to come. This may be an encouragement for a man of God here probably. It is important that we sustain the grace to be diligent. Ministry is serious business. Just because we have advantages like the anointing, the spirit of wisdom, it does not mean that we ignore or negate the need to be students, to study, to be diligent, to be sound in doctrine. Here's how the Bible puts it. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you're in ministry here or God is calling you into ministry, realize that beyond titles, beyond whatever ministerial office, you are mandated by God. Every man of God, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. I repeat, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. The teaching ministry is the exclusive platform that makes for the growth and the maturity of the saints. And if for any reason that man of God is not a teacher, you must unashamedly outsource a sound teaching ministry that becomes the pillar for growth and development. Are we together? Amen. Tonight, I am teaching... On a subject that I believe would bless us all, the house of God. Please write it down. We're exploring by the Spirit what the church is, the ecclesia, the house of God. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, Tuesday, or every other day, especially in Africa, we have people moving from their homes to Christian religious places of worship. And on average, most believers will tell you, I am going to church. Is that true? Where are you? They say, I am in church. And the word church has been seldom understood by many believers. And um, we've had preachers here and there try to bring illumination to the subject of the house of God and the church. It is my responsibility under God and my joy to enlighten us according to scripture, to understand in addition to the truths that we have learned and we continue to learn, to understand what exactly is the church. The goal for this teaching is to bring us to superior spiritual knowledge as to the implication of being in and being part of the house of God. Are we blessed? Genesis 28. Let's start from there for a reference. Genesis 28. Let's 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's begin our reading from verse 10. This is a scripture about Jacob and his encounter with the God of heaven. The first encounter. He had two principal encounters. The first was in 28, chapter 28. The second was in chapter 22. Haven't been in Laban's house for over 20 years. Now the Bible says Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Uh -huh. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. The Bible says, and he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Now, I don't know how he slept on stones. And lay down in that place to sleep. And the Bible says, he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Follow the dream carefully, 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. At this point, there was no God of Jacob. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. Uh -huh. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed next verse and behold i am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and i will bring thee again into this land for i will not leave thee until i have done that which i have spoken to you of this is a good place for someone to say amen, amen. that god is saying i will not leave you until i do to you everything i said i would do amen. 16 Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Right? So we see lack of discernment here. 17. He was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? Here was his conclusion. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. In other words, this kind of experience, based on what my father taught me, if such an experience should happen, where you have the innumerable company of angels, is that true? Where you have God himself speaking to edify, to reveal his promises, to show you his ways, and to assure you of his presence. He says this is none other there is no other environment that can capture this kind of encounter except the house of God. Hallelujah. This is very powerful. Next scripture, Matthew chapter 16. The first biblical mention of the word church. From verse 13, Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus was with the disciples and the Bible says he came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and he asked the disciples. So the revelation of the church according to Jesus began with a question. What is the question? Who do men say that I the son of man am? His identity as the son of man. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, Elijah now. Some say Jeremiah. Some say you are one of the prophets. And then 15, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? That means these people are giving their propositions because they are far. They are not close. They have not had the privilege of proximity. Now that you have been with me, we've eaten together, we've gone for crusades together, what is your conclusion about me? And Jesus Christ was amazed that none of them could speak. All of those multitudes, the 72, the 12, now they stood and they were completely in limbo, not knowing what to say in response to that question. 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now he makes a very strong statement, and I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Please keep that scripture there. It says you are Peter, and upon this rock, now I'm not here to bring up theological debates. Many people have said the rock is Peter. Many people have said the rock. No, 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 no. It's very clear from scripture. He says you are Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? Upon this revelation, upon this understanding you have had that I am Christ, the son of the living God. Are we together now? Yes. Upon this revelation, I will build my church. And if allowed to be built by me, it will be so formidable that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are we still together? So Jesus here is speaking about the church. He made mention of the fact that more than just dying for the sins of the world, that he came to inaugurate an institution. He came to inaugurate a phenomenon, if I would call it, called the church. And he said that this entity will be so formidable. Listen carefully. It will be the entity that sustains the power to triumph and prevail over the gates of hell. The idea of church did not start with the founders of ministries. The idea of church did not start with some of our patriarchs alive and dead. The idea of church was not just a government initiative to have an institution that supports activities um, that relate to faith and spirituality. No. The idea of church was God's own invention. It was a product of God's own intelligence. Listen very carefully. Because many believers view church as several things. For others, they believe that church represents a building that has some level of excellence connected to it where believers come together and then they have the opportunity to worship God. Others believe that church refers to individuals. Others believe that church refers to any platform that carries a semblance of spirituality or any platform that seems to have loyalty to the tenets of the Christian faith. So my question tonight very briefly is what is the church? I'm going to be giving you three dimensions of the church in our discussion tonight. What exactly is the church? Because if you do not know what the church is, you will embrace any definition that the devil gives you about the church. The reason why many people do not respect the church is because they do not even understand what it is. It is a very mysterious entity that the government cannot define. It is a mysterious entity that academicians cannot define. It was not a product of a research from an institution. The church came from the mind of the fountain of wisdom himself. So journey with me as we explore three definitions which represent three dimensions to our understanding of the church number one the first revelation of the church according to scripture is found in Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20 please give it to us Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20 it says thou art my battle axe and my weapons of war for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Uh huh. It says, and with thee I will break in pieces the horse and his rider, and with thee I will break in pieces the chariot and his rider. 
And with thee I will break in pieces man and woman. With thee I will break in pieces old and young. With thee I will break in pieces young man and the maid. Last verse. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee I will break in pieces the husband man and his yoke of oxen. With thee I will break in pieces captains and ruler. Is there any class of society that was missing here? None. You are my battle axe. I am using you. So the first definition of the church, write it down please, that the church is a spiritual strategy. More than a people, the first revelation of the church that I want you to have is the church as a spiritual strategy, an invention from God's intelligence, a spiritual strategy, listen to me, mandated to be used by God as the only tool that is able to purge, to cleanse, to build, and to reveal Christ and his purposes in its fullness. This is the church. The church is a strategy. For instance, if, um, if I have a flat tire or I have a, pro a problem with my car and I'm unable to move it, I can hire another car that will help to drag it to a place where it will be fixed. And a strategy is usually invented where I can connect. Is that true? and connect with a moving car that is alive, a towing van, and then connect to the vehicle, and the towing van pushes it. That, that is a strategy to remedy for something. The fact that the church came into being is already proof that there was something that was not correct. Are we together now? So the church has come as a spiritual strategy to remedy a condition, to remedy a situation. There are names that we are called in scripture. One of it is light. Another is salt. Jesus Christ himself called us light and salt. That immediately suggests that for us to be called light means there is darkness. For us to be called salt means there is a level of tastelessness somewhere and lack of preservation. So the church is a spiritual strategy. The church in fact is the only spiritual strategy that sustains the ability to reveal Christ in his fullness and to bring him glory. Please write it down. The only spiritual strategy that has the capacity to reveal Christ, to subdue principalities and powers. Oh, this is powerful. Thou art my battle axe. That means wherever there is darkness, wherever there is confusion, listen carefully, wherever there is lack of growth and enlightenment, wherever the purposes of God have not been made institutional within any territory, it is a reflection that the church may not be there or the church may not be shining as light. The church is a strategy. So do not ask why you are put in the midst of darkness. You are a strategy. God's strategy. Are we together? For every car that you buy, usually you would have a few tools in that car. Is that true? Most people would have a toolbox containing screwdrivers and, and, and um, you know, and um, spanners and all of those things. You would have an extra tire somewhere in the car and you would have a jack, you know, to help you if you have a flat tire. All of those things are tools and they are strategies to make sure that for no reason do you stop moving forward if you need to. So when you have a flat tire, what do you do? You go to the back of that car and open up the toolbox and you begin to effectively use the tools that will help maybe replacement. There are times that you can bring out an extra tire that helps to move the car. There are times that you can bring out all kinds of tools. That is how you are. That means whenever there is darkness, God pulls out from his toolbox and brings someone out. The church is a spiritual strategy. Wow. I am not just a man of God. I am a strategy. Do you know what that means? I am a strategy, a tool 
to be able to achieve something very divine achieve something very exact as far as the revelation of the Christ is concerned that immediately cures you from this sense of complex and inferiority you did not just happen across the surface of the earth you were a strategy a strategy takes time to bring forth many of you are mathematicians if you are you are trying to solve a problem you sit down you think scientists will come up with all kinds of hypotheses and go through all kinds of verification systems until it becomes a theory you are the final decision of the intelligence of God did you hear what I said your your arrival the church as a strategy means you are the final decision of a conclusion the parliament of heaven sat down and thought of how the purposes of God will remain and you were the conclusion of that meeting the church is a spiritual strategy the only strategy that sustains the ability to make kingdom come a reality is God speaking to anyone hmm. so when you know this you do not begin to frown at the church every time you see the church involved in issues that represent darkness if it is true that the church is a strategy it means that strategy should find expression in politics in government in business am i right he said i will break in pieces and he began to list different people men were captured in that experience women maids rulers princes captains everyone so the cure for the political decadence in africa generally is the church the cure for the economic problems of men this is the reason why when you say the church has no business in empowering men you are already it is it is um what do we call it now you are insulting the very definition of the church wherever there is darkness is exactly where we are invited is someone learning now yeah. can i tell you the truth if everybody becomes a preacher called into the fivefold ministry the church will die because that was not the bible says some he gave some so the proposition that everybody should become a man of god like to preach as the way to bring kingdom come is a very sincere but inaccurate understanding the pulpit is the platform that shapes the understanding of the people like i'm doing but the real place of assignment is not the pulpit the real place of assignment is wherever there is darkness help me list a few places that you know in our world today where there is darkness in one word or two words everywhere am i right on that someone say everywhere does that include the government does that include schools does that include our banking system everywhere so how relevant is the church are you sure the church should be relevant in activities of finances are you sure the church should be relevant in politics and governance are you sure the church should be relevant in handling demons and principalities and powers no other strategy sustains the power to do that listen can i be honest with you based on scripture and based on history almost and I'm, I'm saying this as an opinion which is grounded on scripture almost every other religion and institution that i know do not have the power to cast out demons what happens is called occultic pacifism pacifism is an act of appeasal it was an ancient ritual that was used to appease demons that means when a spirit comes and is troubling an individual through some um activity of necromancy and all of that you conjure the spirit to ask you what it wants and the spirit can say i'm hungry you are eating and i've not eaten and you ask what do you want he's saying bring one goat we, you see it happen in our cultures bring one goat bring one chicken make sure it's black and so based on what the spirit is asking for you politely and laboriously go and look for what it's looking for and then it will seem to pacify itself you will see that the individual will have a semblance of healing 
Then you continue making progress and the spirit will come again. In ancient times, Old Testament particularly, when they found people who were demonized, they were usually stoned to death. Because since they did not have the ability, except for a few people who were involved in casting out demons, and the art of deliverance or, or casting out demons was not something that was really understood, you see from scripture. So, when Jesus showed up, as a model of the church and there were demonic people instead of killing the people he could neatly with surgical precision separate the influence from the individual and when they saw this they said no you are using Beelzebub the prince of demons you have found a way of rising in the realm of the spirit to negotiate your way with this prince of demons. You are just manipulating us. And Jesus said, no. If I cast it by Beelzebub, by who do your own fathers? Because many of them entered into covenants and fraternity with demon spirits. Now look up, please. Listen. M most of the African cultures today have people who are mediums. Is that true? Their assignment is to be um, the mediators between the spirit entities that control those territories. We have all kinds of names, but they are all the same. So, when a land seems to be barren, listen carefully, when a land seems to not produce optimally, or when there is war and people are dying, or there's a plague or pandemic of some sort, usually, these individuals who can be priests or mediums or whatever they are, they are mandated to go through divination and all kinds of satanic operation to now ask those spirits what is wrong. Is that true? And to do that, they have to use divination and conjure these spirits. Should I teach this now? But listen, listen. The only way you move spirits from one safe location according to them to another safe location is to simulate the habitation of that spirit. Let me give you an instance. Now, we will never glorify the devil in the name of Jesus. But say I were not a believer and say I'm some idol worshiper in the village somewhere. If I want to call a spirit from wherever it is, to a festival that is happening. Do you know what I need to do? My first assignment is to study the habitat of that spirit. Spiritually. And then through these sacrifices, I simulate the same environment of that spirit. It can now live wherever it is and come right there and still feel at home. This is the reason why, based on that same principle, God is comfortable to be in heaven and yet live in your heart. Because your heart... Is a simulation of the throne so he can stay comfortable in your heart the Holy Ghost has never complained living in you dearly beloved I hope you were blessed by this message do not keep the video to yourself share to as many as you can to help them bless check our home page for more of our messages subscribe to the channel comment on it like it see you on our next video Bye. Pray, pray, pray for your destiny. Salaska de Bashka Nakata Branda Katekatos, Kate Branda Katapa Kotosko to break a take a Nakata. The phase of development, Lord, grant me the discipline.